In the previous video, we presented general equations for the update step in single object tracking. In particular, we presented detailed expressions for the probabilities of different hypotheses, as well as the posterior density given a data association hypothesis. In this video, we try to make sense of these equations by considering their expressions in a simple and important special case. To obtain a closed form expression for the posterior density, we make three simplifying assumptions. First, that the prior is Gaussian. Second, that the probability of detection is constant. And third, that the object measurement likelihood is linear and Gaussian. Note that we don't need to make any simplifying assumptions on the clutter intensity. We sometimes informally refer to a single object tracking model that satisfies these assumptions as linear and Gaussian, even though we have also assumed a constant probability of detection, and even though we have unknown data associations. As usual, we decompose the posterior into one term for each data association hypothesis, and we will now study the detailed expressions for w theta and p theta of x. Let us start by considering p theta of x, which is the posterior of x given the data association theta and the measurements z. We can actually compute p theta of x using the update step presented in the video about single object tracking with known associations, but it's easy to derive, and I'll repeat it here for completeness. In the previous video, we found that p theta of x is proportional to the following expression when theta is equal to zero, and the following expression when theta is greater than zero. Under the assumption that the probability of detection is constant, we obtain a simpler expression, since the factors one minus pd and pd can be absorbed into the proportionality constant. When theta is equal to zero, p theta of x is simply proportional to the prior density. That is, we skip the update step if the object is undetected. If theta is greater than zero, p theta of x is proportional to the prior times g of z theta given x. That is, we update the prior using the likelihood g of z theta given x, if theta states that z theta is the object measurement. Note that we only use the assumption that pd is constant, and the expression for p theta already looks much simpler. To obtain closed form expressions, we also assume that p of x is a Gaussian density, and that g of o given x is linear and Gaussian. Stating that p theta of x is proportional to Gaussian prior times a linear and Gaussian likelihood function implies that p theta of x is the posterior when we update this prior by this likelihood, which means that p theta of x is a Gaussian density. In fact, we can use the Kalman filter equations to compute the mean and covariance of the Gaussian density p theta of x, and by now you should be familiar with these equations. We've concluded that if theta is greater than zero, p theta of x can be computed using a Kalman filter update, where we assume that z theta is the object measurement. For visualization, let us return to the example that we studied in the video about the complete measurement model. The only difference here is that we now have a Gaussian prior as well, in this case with mean 0.5 and variance 0.5, and we are visualizing the posterior density instead of the measurement likelihood. If you want, you can of course compare the posterior density with the likelihood in that function and check if the relation between the prior likelihood and posterior looks reasonable. What I want you to focus on here are the curves W0, P0 of X, W1, P1 of X, and W2, P2 of X. The weights W0, W1, and W2 make it slightly complicated to see the shapes of the densities. However, P1 of X is obtained from a Kalman filter update using Z1, P2 is obtained from a Kalman filter update using Z2, whereas P0 of X is identical to the prior. Let us now look at the part that you haven't seen before, namely how to compute the weights. In particular, I would like you to understand the equations for the weights and check if they are reasonable considering that the weights are the data association probabilities. We found that the unnormalized weight is the integral of p of x times one minus pd of x when theta is equal to zero. And when theta is greater than zero, the unnormalized weight is one over lambda z of z theta times this integral. The factor lambda c of z theta is perhaps the least intuitive part of this equation. One way to reason about it is that there are only two possible explanations of z theta. It is either an object detection or a clutter detection. It makes sense that the probability that z theta is clutter grows with the clutter intensity lambda c of z theta, since this is related to the probability that we receive a clutter detection in the vicinity of z theta. 
Consequently, the probability that Z theta is an object detection should therefore shrink as we increase lambda c of Z theta, which is what we see here. Now, if PD is constant, these two integrals simplify since the factors 1 minus PD and PD can be extracted out from the integrals. For theta equals 0, the remaining integral is just the integral over P of x, which is 1, and the unnormalized weight is therefore 1 minus PD. For theta greater than 0, we are left with an integral over P of x times G of Z theta given x. The way PD enters these equations, we can see that the probability that the object is undetected decreases with PD, and the probability that the object is detected grows with PD. Note that these weights are unnormalized and that the final probabilities of the different hypotheses depend on the normalization factor, which is the sum of all the unnormalized weights. The integral over p of x times g of z theta given x can be thought of as the predicted density of the measurement evaluated at z theta. This may not be entirely obvious, but it has the same form as the chapman kolmogorov equation with the minor difference that we have replaced the motion model pi with a measurement model g. To obtain the final expression, we need to simplify the integral over p times g. Given our linear and Gaussian assumptions, we get that the unnormalized weight, when theta is greater than zero, is pd divided by the intensity function at z theta times an integral. Here, the integral is over a Gaussian density with mean mu and covariance p, evaluated at x, times another Gaussian density with mean hx and covariance r, evaluated at z theta. This is integrated over all values of x. Now, this integral is the tricky part, but it actually has a known and simple expression. It turns out that it is identical to Gaussian density with mean hx and covariance hp h transpose plus r, evaluated at z theta. To remember this result, I personally find it helpful to write down the densities as algebraic equations. If z theta is equal to hx plus v, where x is Gaussian with mean mu and covariance p, and v is Gaussian with mean 0 and covariance r, then we know that z theta is Gaussian with mean h times mu and covariance matrix h p h transpose plus r. All you have to do now to obtain this equation is to realize that the integral on the left-hand side actually expresses the distribution over z theta under these assumptions. For theta greater than zero, the unnormalized weight is therefore pd times the predicted likelihood divided by lambda c of z theta. We have already discussed pd and lambda c, so the last thing to make sense of is the predicted likelihood, which is a Gaussian density with mean z bar and covariance matrix S evaluated at z theta. What this says is that the hypothesis obtains a small weight unless the measurement z theta is close to where we would expect to find the object measurement, where S determines what we mean by close. If S tells us that we are very uncertain about where the measurement may be, the unnormalized weight is less sensitive to the value of z theta. Let us visualize these results to make them more concrete. We've concluded that the unnormalized weight is 1 minus pd if theta is equal to 0, and pd times the predicted likelihood divided by lambda c of z theta, if theta is an integral between 1 and m. If we return to the previous example, we see that since the prior has the mean 0.5, and g says that o is x plus some noise, it follows that z bar is 0.5. Similarly, we find that s is just the variance of x plus the variance of the measurement noise, according to g which is 0 0.5 plus 0 0.2, which is 0 0.7. Since z bar is 0 0.5, we can see that z2 is close to z bar, whereas z1 is further away from z bar. This makes the predicted likelihood much larger for z2 than for z1. It is also clear from the visualization that w2 is larger than w1, since the area under w2 times p2 is much larger than the area under w1 times p1. If z1 would have taken an even smaller value, w1 would have been close to zero. In the video about the measurement model, we looked at how the likelihood changed with pd. If we increase pd to 0 0.95, the main difference is that w0 is reduced, whereas w1 and w2 are increased slightly. 
This is what we expected to see based on the expressions for W tilde. If we instead decrease PD to 0.5, the probability that the object is undetected is increased and the posterior density no longer has two distinct peaks. Under the assumption that the prior is Gaussian, PD is constant and G of O given X is linear and Gaussian, we have obtained simple expressions. The density P theta of X is either not updated at all or obtained using a simple Kalman filter update using the measurement Z theta. The unnormalized weight is either 1 minus PD or PD times the predicted likelihood divided by lambda C of Z theta. All of the parameters Z bar, S, X hat theta and P plus are obtained from a simple Kalman filter. Before we finish, I'd like to make an important remark. It is common to model the object detections as a nonlinear function f of x plus some Gaussian noise v. Even though this prevents us from using a comma filter, we can still use a Gaussian filter, such as the extended comma filter or an uncentered comma filter, to approximate x hat theta, p plus, z bar, and s. For the models that we consider, it is straightforward to do this, and this enables us to use the derived equations also for nonlinear models.